Is this on or off? It's on. It's on. It's the uh, chair of the evening was off, but this is on. All right. New immigrants to New York. How and when will they gain power in government? And that is our topic for tonight. And um, this is the uh, spring forum of the Cary, UL Cary Center for Government Reform at Wagner College. And uh, I will be saying a few words later and moderating the program, but at the same time, it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers that we have. Uh, and I see there are more people coming in. Can you come up front, please? Thank you. Um, first person I want to introduce uh, is the president of Wagner College, Richard Grassi. He is not only our top administrator, top scholar, one of the best presidents in the country, and even if I were CSI, I would say that. <laughs> and uh, he's an unusual person. He's been very helpful to the growth of the UL Carey Center at Wagner College. He jumped at the idea. It's now a very viable operation, and it's growing, I hope, in quality as well as quantity. And this is one of the lectures that we have. Uh, we have several during the year. Uh, I believe outside, probably saw some of the monographs and articles that our professional staff has uh, written and produced. And please feel free to take it when you leave uh, this evening. Um, Dr. Garassi, as I said, supported us from the very beginning and to, continues to support us with a great deal of fervor. And um, let me just say about this individual, in the absence of his wife, because <coughs> she were here, I would say it also. <laughs> um, a French philosopher once said, rare is the man who thinks as a man of action and acts as a man of thought. We have that rarity here as our president. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a man who thinks as a man of action and acts as a man of thought, Dr. Richard Garassi, the president of Wagner College. Thank you, Seymour. And welcome, everybody. Uh, I will be sure, because I stand between you and a spectacular lecturer, Joe Salva, who I've heard speak on several occasions, uh, most recently at the Center for Jewish History, on a panel that we did for this, uh, for this organization as well. I can't think of any issue that's more pressing in your lifetime uh, than integrity in government. Uh, it will be the key towards unlocking our ability to address issues of sustainability in our environment. It will be the key to unlocking the kind of chances for mobility and access into prosperity that all of you hope you'll have in your generation, and I'm sure you will. Uh, and, and this center, the Center for, for Government Reform, attempts to address significant questions in a nonpartisan way across the spectrum of ideas that deal with integrity in government and honesty and ethics. Uh, at a time when we're looking at a deep recession, although the stock market has gone up 700 <coughs> points in two days, so we're all hopeful that this is the bottom and we're turning around. Uh, but still with the deep uh, unemployment, foreclosures, we see this all over Staten Island, our borough is right here, our home borough, but throughout New York and throughout the country. Uh, these are deep issues of trust in the fact of uh, whether or not our government can serve the people uh, well, honestly, with some uh, forethought and resilience in terms of meeting these, these kinds of problems. So this notion of reestablishing trust and integrity is absolutely essential, and particularly essential in state government. Uh, state governments have reappeared back on the scene as so significant a piece of the, the uh, political fabric and governmental fabric of our country. So we've done lots of this work in the center, and I'm so pleased because Joe's topic is one that's near and dear to all of us uh, in terms of the city. The city has always been a beacon, uh, a, a setting, an arena for upward mobility for immigrants. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to sustain that role as we go forward. It's always been a city renewed by its immigrants, 
Uh, and if you look at the 1990s and certainly post-2001, uh, the influx of new immigrants to the city has made a huge difference in the success of our economy, as well as the influx of capital that uh, came along with it. So I can't say enough about this particular topic. I, having Knowing what some of Joe's work has been about, I think you're going to learn a tremendous amount about the patterns of immigration as well as the status of new immigrants. So I can't say enough, and I'm happy you're all here. Welcome. And I'm anxious for Joe to take the, seat, take the, the chair here in a second, too. Thank you. I'm going to move out here so I can actually see the screen. Yes, I think I'm going to do the same thing. And uh, Karen Garassi has arrived. I mentioned your name before. <laughs> um, we are very fortunate in terms of our speakers tonight. And I want to thank uh, President Garassi for his words of greeting. Uh, I share his basic evaluation of our, our lead speaker tonight as well as the chair of our government and politics department. First on the agenda, please, let's sit down. Don't be embarrassed to <laughs> come down. Um, the first speaker tonight is someone who uh, President Garassi and I have come to know through the years. Uh, his name is Dr. Joseph Salvo. Dr. Salvo is the director of the population division of the New York City Department of City Planning. The population division serves as the city's in-house demographic consultant, <coughs> providing expertise for a whole host of applications involving assessments of need, program planning and targeting, and policy formulation. This, of course, includes the development of population estimates and projection for infrastructure and capital planning, such as projections for Plan New York City, the long-term sustainability plan for the city of New York. It's good to realize that New York City is sustainable in the future. The division is also working closely <coughs> with the Census Bureau on the technical preparation for the 2010 Census which is just around the corner, an evaluation of the New American Community Survey. Dr. Salvo's publications are in the areas of decennial census issues, survey methods, and the residential settlement of immigrants. He currently serves on the Census Advisory Committee of Professional Associations and is a former president of the Association of Public Data Users. Dr. Salvo received MA and PH degrees from Fordham University. He's a recipient of the Sloan Public Service Award from the Fund for the City of New York and a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Dr. Salvo, welcome to Wagner College and to Staten Island. He tells me he has an hour and a half to get home tonight. <laughs> he lives in New York City, but I think at the top of the Bronx. <laughs> All right, and Dr. Salvo has prepared a slide PowerPoint um, projection about regarding the topic, and when he's through, uh, he has a very competent deputy here in Dr. Frank Body, who might participate in the question and answer period if he sees fit. But let me introduce to all of you Dr. Joseph Salvo. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I very much like to give these presentations uh, because, frankly, uh, there's a lot that demography can offer as a basis for understanding issues. The issue is about uh, uh, immigrants and their uh, uh, power in or their uh, gaining foothold in government. Before we can discuss such an issue, you need to have a basis need to understand uh, the immigrant picture of New York, how it's changing, or what I call the immigrant dynamic. There are about five or six points that I'm going to leave you with today. Those five or six points can serve as a basis for discussion. Um, as I go through these points, I would be very happy if you would uh, jot down a question or two, things that might be of interest. Because to be honest, Frank and I do these presentations because we learn a lot from the audience about what's on the minds of people who are asking the questions that need to be asked about policy, for example, about programs. 
Each of you has a perspective that you uh, uh, develop from your everyday experiences, from walking the streets of Staten Island, from walking the streets of New York. Your job is to compare your own individual perspectives to what I'm going to show you, reality test it, because I have what is called a representative sample. Those of you in statistics know what I mean, um, uh, if you've had a, such a class. It is essentially a picture based upon what we think is a representative uh, sample, or that is a, 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 a real kind of on the ground picture of what's happening in New York. The first thing that I want to address, the five boroughs, I just want to make sure everybody knows. You know the Bronx is the only borough attached to mainland United States. Everybody knows that. You live in Staten Island, so you'll know that. <laughs> People in Brooklyn and Queens frequently don't know that. And Brooklyn and Queens is part of Long Island, but we won't say that. <laughs> All right, first thing I want to talk to you about is the components of population change, all right? Most people view the population of the city of New York this way. You got this big hulk, and every year you add a piece to it, all right? In 1980, uh, uh, the uh, population of the city was um, not that substantial, actually, by its current standards. It was 7,072,000. In 1990, the population was 7.3 million. In 2000, Finally, the city officially went over the 8 million mark. In reality, back in 1970, had we taken into account the under-enumeration that took place in the census, the city actually had about 8 million, right around 8 million people. But officially, we hit the 8 million mark in 2000. We are now at 8.3, actually, it's not up here, but 2007 is 8,310,212, uh, but we was counting exactly. Um, you can see the population is on a growth trend. Okay, um, we've added about 300,000 people. Our projection for the mayor's sustainability plan is 9.2 million, uh, over 9.2 million in the year 2035. Now, of course, this is a long-term projection. Demographers are not suffering from the beating that economists are currently taking. But nonetheless, we are uh, susceptible to all kinds of problems. As you know, I do not have a crystal ball. Some people claim that I do, but I, I really don't. Uh, but this is how you view the population. It's kind of this big hulk and you add to it. That is not reality. This is reality. New York City ha has, in the first seven years of this decade, lost over 800,000 people through domestic migration. That is 800,000 more have left for the 50 states than have come in from the 50 states, okay? We have shed people domestically. We gain a big chunk of it back, over 600,000, through immigration. Our net change, you see that third bar up from the bottom, the orange one, is that we actually have a net loss through migration. Um, it is uh, about 200,000 people. So this exchange is the reality of what happens in New York. Now, why do we care about this? Because this explains why, and people say to me, why don't those people learn English? How come I go on the subway? Well, I guess the, what do you have here, the SIRT? Is that what it's called? Okay. It's a cute, it's a cute action. I've been on it. So um, when you listen, you hear people uh, speak other languages all the time. And people say to me, you, you guys say you offer 50,000 seats for English. Eventually, everybody's going to learn it, right? And eventually, more people will speak English on the subway. No, that's not the way it works. People come and go in huge numbers in the neighborhoods of New York. And what that means is that the people who provide those services, the people who provide health services, education services, their job will never end. In effect, because new people are showing up every day and people are leaving every day. So you might say, New York's a safe city. How could we lose 800,000 people due to domestic migration? There's something wrong with that. What I am here to tell you today is not only is there nothing wrong with that, that is the sign of a dynamic and healthy place. If I take you today to Cleveland, if I take you to Cincinnati, to Buffalo, Detroit, they have no, they don't have that much out migration per se. Okay, people have left. People are still leaving. They don't have these huge flows. They're not dynamic like New York. Dynamism, this is what it is. People coming and going on a constant basis. People who leave are doing better than people who come in. Well, duh, the fact of the matter is, that's why people come to New York. Opportunities that we uh, <coughs> provide here are very attractive to immigrants. So now, if you take that domestic, uh, that uh, net migration loss, the orange bar, third up from the bottom, and you combine that with natural increase, which is the balance of births and deaths, we have had more than 400,000 more births than deaths in the city of New York 
in this period. It results in a net increase in population. This is how the population changes, not the previous chart I showed you. This is the dynamic. And this is what makes New York a really special place and why we have a constant injection of energy into the city. So that's one thing I want to leave you with. Another thing I want to leave you with, <clears throat> the secondary effects of immigration. 53% of the births in the city of New York are to foreign-born women. If you add dad in, it's more than six out of every 10 births, either mom or dad are foreign-born. Five countries account for more than a quarter of all the births in New York City. And you see Mexico, the Dominican Republic, China, Jamaica, and Ecuador. Mexico is now number one in births among foreign-born groups. It tells us something about their presence in the city. Generally, you cannot hide a birth. One of the ways that we figure out who's here is by looking at the number of births, because we can associate the number of births with a population on the ground, so to speak, not as a result of some survey. So we, we develop estimates of the population that we think is really here, including undocumented this way. Now, foreign-born population. Over 3 million currently, as of 2006. More than double what it was back in 1970, as you can see here. The city is 37% foreign born. Another fact, the city's percent foreign born will never rise all that much. The record in the 20th century was 1910, 1920. About 40% of our population was foreign born. 4-0, okay? It never rises much above that. You know why now? because of the chart I showed you before. If 53% of the births are the foreign-born mothers and those kids are native-born, you see why. There is almost a cap on the percent foreign-born. So you will hear frequently uh, people talk about 40 or 45%. No, it's about 37% currently. <coughs> Our major countries, look at 1970 and look at 2006. You see how the city has changed, so how it's changed in, by and large, in a non-violent way. The tumultuous change that occurs in New York City, a theme that I want to leave with you also uh, this evening, is that in many parts of the world, if you put together this combination of countries, you will see a great degree of conflict. You do not see that in New York. My argument has always been that people are too busy making a living, earning a living. People are too busy conducting the business that they came here to develop being entrepreneurs, trying to increase the quality of life for them and for their children. If you look at the left, you see the European city that was New York in 1970, 63% non-Hispanic white, essentially European. And now you see the New York City that is Asian, that is Caribbean, that is Hispanic, South American, the whole mix of countries that we have here. Now, in terms of the topic about government <coughs> becoming empowered, so to speak, becoming part of the government. What I want you to think about <clears throat> is New York versus some other places. Take a look at this combination. So now let's look at Los Angeles. <laughs> One and a half million foreign born in 2006, about half the number that are in New York. We got the top eight countries in New York City and we don't barely have half of the total. Think about all the constituencies, how different they are. Look at Los Angeles. Between the Mexicans and the Salvadorans, you have the majority of the foreign-born population in Los Angeles. Let's look at Chicago, the third largest city. See, about 600,000 immigrants. Mexico is 48% of the total. Add Poland to it, and you're well over half. Again, New York City, eight sources, and you're not even at it. Houston, the next largest city. 52% Mexican. When you talk about, as, as we will discuss later on, the, the political overlay on the population, think about the different constituencies, the ethnic constituencies that develop here in New York because of our diversity that frankly may not develop in other places. Or in other places, you may deal with one or two big populations, but by and large, you don't have the massive numbers by country that you have here. <coughs> now, how does this all play out? Now look, this is extremely ambitious. We just started using this chart. <clears throat> I'm going to go over it quickly because it's a challenge. This chart is a result of the fact that uh, several people 
at, at City Hall and other places have said to me, Salvo, I want a snapshot of the city on one slide. Who we are, ethnic, ancestry, and race, all together. <clears throat> Start with the Asian population. It is, has been for many decades, between 40 and 50% Chinese. You see the Asian Indian, the Korean, the Filipino, the blend here. You see Pakistan show up. There's a country not here, which is now number five on our list, Bangladesh. The future of New York, as far as Asia is concerned, not only involves India and China, but increasingly involves Pakistan, increasingly involves the Bangladeshi populations. <clears throat> Hispanic, once dominated totally by Puerto Rican population, now less so. You see Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican. You see the blend. Although I should tell you, given where you are, that Queens and Staten Island have actually increased in their share of Puerto Ricans in New York. Why? Suburbanization within the city. People may choose to come to Staten Island for the same reason they go to Queens. Home ownership. Uh, it is the middle class borough. Okay? So uh, you've got a blend of Hispanic subgroups. So the black population, and we're struggling with this, Caribbean, 36%. South removed, were, for want of a better term, these are uh, African Americans with their heritage linked to the great migration that started in 1910 and worked its way through up until 1970 from the southern states. And then the white population we can spend another 20 minutes on. It's a blend of older uh, immigrant groups such as the Italian and Irish populations, the new Russians, uh, a blend of Eastern European groups that have all come, many of these groups have kind of held their own. In some cases, the diehard factor is set in among Italians. They're Italians, uh, present company included, who, who will probably never leave the Bronx. Okay? <laughs> when you get down to a certain point, so you never go to zero. You go near zero, but then the diehard factor kicks in, and then you know, people aren't leaving <clears throat> after a certain percentage. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. When you talk later about who is gaining politically, who is doing what, all the coalitions that need to be built, ethnic, racial, ancestry, my god, it is dizzying in the city to try to figure this out. Now, I want to couple this with something else. <coughs> Let me see if I pick my age. <clears throat> if you look at a whole bunch of neighborhoods in New York City and you look at these groups, you will notice many of them are very young. There are a lot of young people in some groups. Other groups are dominated by older people. Um, if you ever ask, how could in some neighborhoods in New York, which have seeming, seemingly shifted their ethnic composition, how come another European gets elected? The answer is having to do with the older population, which votes like crazy, and which, when you look at the population by age, still dominates the population, for example, 65 and over in some communities. If I were to do this for council districts, for state senate, state assembly districts, we could demonstrate that a big chunk of the voter population is actually European, even though the population has turned over because the, because the other populations, the newer immigrants, are very, very young, especially, for example, the Mexican population, also non-citizen, the Mexican population, the Dominican population. But look, the news is, look at the population under 18. This is the future of New York. Um, substantial <coughs> contingents of every group with no group dominating the demographic landscape. Um, you will be looking very soon at a New York that has a level of diversity that is probably as substantial as it was 100 years ago, perhaps unprecedented because it crosses racial lines. <coughs> Big issue for anybody who's thinking about reaching out. A any of you get involved in social services. If you take the 7.6 million New Yorkers ages five and over, you look at this chart, you see that close to half speak a language other than English at home. <clears throat> if you take that slice and then you look at the people who have problems with English, it amounts to about a quarter of our population 1.8 million New Yorkers have problems with English. So why don't they learn English? You should know now, from what I showed you earlier, this constant churning of population produces a situation where new people are in front of you every minute. It means, when I speak to city agencies, that the job of the people who do language translation, the jobs of the people who deliver social services, 
all kinds of health services, they come to me and they say, why am I so tired? I educate these people every year, and new people are always showing up. My job never ends. Well, that is the, that is the key to New York, the major challenge. When you are a city like ours, dynamic, and you have an influx of people on a constant basis, people moving out and people coming in, you face a continuous challenge of providing services for people who are always new. It means your job never ends. So I get to break this news, for example, to people who provide health education, that essentially it's not like you keep providing a service and then eventually it's not needed anymore. The dynamism of the city requires continuous attention. <coughs> Again, if you're concerned about this dynamic, go and look at places with the absence of such a dynamic. It's like I mentioned before, I don't want to pick on Buffalo. <coughs> I'll pick on Philadelphia. So no, if you look at Philadelphia, if you look at Buffalo, you look at a lot of places where people are not coming and going, what you have is stagnation. When you get that form of stagnation, in its most serious form, you have it today in the cities of Japan, you have it today in Northern Europe, where there is literally an absence of working people. There is nobody to come in and support the labor force. Let me skip over this for a second. Forty-seven percent of all New Yorkers, I'm sorry, forty-seven percent of, of the labor force, of all, New, all resident workers are foreign born. Forty-seven percent. And look at this by industry. Take a look at education, health, and social services. Major industry in New York employing over 900,000 people. Accommodation, food, and other services. Look at the percentage foreign born across the board. Immigrants are vital to our economy. We cannot survive without them. If you remove this, because most immigrants are in the young working ages, if you remove this component, then you get stagnation. You get a situation like you have today in some of the countries that do not have, do, are, are not welcoming immigrants. Uh, many Japanese cities, I'm sure you've read these stories, are coming up with all kinds of short-term solutions, including taking in refuse from other parts of the country in an effort to raise revenue to support an aging population and uh, essentially a, a city or a, a town that cannot exist on its own any longer because the working population is left. They're not attracting any new people. This will happen to whole countries, whole countries in Northern, in, in Northern Europe. It's happening in parts of Germany, where the young people leave, they are not replaced because there's no dynamism and, and, and no reason to attract people. One of the greatest things we have in New York is we attract a lot of young people. Those young people come in and, and, and they produce a dynamism, they produce a, uh, a, a, an injection of vitality into our workforce that keeps us vital and sustains us. So I ask you, I challenge you, to go to some of the other cities in this country and you will see very quickly what is happening. And the truth is, it's also happening in our inner, some of our suburban counties. Uh, Nassau County is not particularly uh, welcoming uh, to development and there are some parts of Nassau County that certainly welcome immigrants, but by and large, restrictions on growth, anti-growth policies have produced uh, different types of uh, zoning resolutions, different types of enforcement can have intimidated immigrants, Nassau is now losing population. Why? Because the domestic flows are still negative, the immigrant flows aren't making up for it. So do you know how we in New York City know that, the di that, that this is going on? Because our out commuting to Westchester, not as bad off as Nassau. So Nassau is increasing every year. Our labor force in New York City is now supporting retail and other industries in our inner ring suburbs because of, their, uh, because of anti growth policy. <coughs> so, immigrants are a vital part of, of the workforce, and that is again another overlay that I can offer you. Let me just tell you <coughs> that we're projecting continued growth. So, people will say to me now, What are you talking about? The economy is in a recession. You know, this has been the worst since the 1930s. How could you say this? Well, I can give you the quick, quick of it. <laughs> Make a long story short. Let's go back to other traumas in the city's history. The 1970s, something that several of your faculty know a lot about. 
you go back to the 1970s, you see the city was on the verge of bankruptcy. The city was in serious, serious trouble. Did you know in the 1970s that New York City got three quarters of a million immigrants in the 1970s when the city was collapsing? Jonathan Marlow's book, The Bronx is Burning, which is really much about Bushwickers, isn't about the Bronx, is, is a must read for those of you who are interested in what happened to New York City in the 1970s. If you go and you, you look at the conditions here, the city was deteriorating, three quarters of a million immigrants. We had two million people who left the city, okay? The city lost upwards of 10% of its population in that period, okay? We have since gained it back. What's my point? Very simple. Immigrants come here because we have opportunities and it's always a relative process. Never ask, how could people come here? Always ask, how could people come here relative to where they came from? It's always a relative thing. If you come here and you're being harassed by governmental authorities, a victim of oppression, dangerous situations where you fear for your day-to-day -day existence, and you come here and the economy's in a recession, it puts things in a bit of a different perspective, a bit of a different perspective, to say the least. So it's always relative. Now, the other trauma, of course, 9-11. What happened? Dislocation in Manhattan. Okay, no question, out-migration that occurred. It was temporary. We made it all back within a few years. Why? Because people want to live in Manhattan. Many people saw it as an opportunity to go and, and actually get an apartment in Manhattan. We recovered from that. What's different about now? Those two situations I just described to you were unique to New York. Okay, the country suffered, but we got hit directly in 9-11. Right? <coughs> this recession, there are places that are wor much worse off than New York right now. In fact, several of those places are destinations for our out migrants. Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and California, the four top foreclosure states in terms of percentage of housing that's in foreclosure. And they got hit really badly. Relatively speaking, our unemployment rate, while it's bad and certainly not good, is nowhere near what it is in Michigan and some other places. We are now suffering along with the rest of the country in a direct way. So our conclusion is over the long haul, where are people going to go? Where do you go to get out of this? The answer is there is no place. So people will make a relative judgment and will stay here by and large. Maybe the pace of coming and going will slow, but New York, over the long haul, will sustain its growth. <coughs> the big news, if any of you are contemplating helping the elderly, person 65 and over, you should consider that occupation because we're projecting a more than 400,000 increase in the population 65 and over. By 2035, we will have many more, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say, older people, is that okay? Um, many more persons 65 and over in the city of New York. And as the population grows, the percent and number of 65 and over will also. All right, I'm going to stop here. Um, I think that's about the yeah. time. I want you to take note of our website. We have a lot of good stuff on our website, including current data about New York City. I thank you very much for listening. I hope you have uh, some really good questions. Okay, for those of you who have come in a little later, why don't you move, uh, get off the stairs and come and get a seat. There's still some left in the front. Okay. Um, the reason why Dr. Salvo was looking at his watch uh, was not his fault, it was my fault, uh, in terms of time allotment. Because we have another distinguished speaker who's a professor at the... Um, at Wagner College, and he's a chair of the um, Department of Government and Politics at Wagner. But it's interesting also, I was unaware of this, uh, Dr. Salvo and Dr. Hu, uh, that if you compare the 1970 to 2006 figures of, the, um, of uh, Dr. Salvo's report and slide projection of PowerPoints, you will find that in in, two, in 1970, uh, the largest population of foreign-borns in New York were from Italy, 
and from Poland, and from the USSR. China was not even listed among the top places of birth for the foreign born. In 2006, the top places of birth for the foreign born are the Dominican Republic, China, and the former Soviet Union. So there's been some great changes that have been taking place uh, over the last uh, 36 years that has been brought to our attention by uh, Dr. Salvo. And uh, before I formally introduce Dr. Hu, there are people in the audience here from Project Diversity who represent uh, Liberia, who represent Ghana, and who represent Mexico. Okay, and Dominican Republic, Sue Rosenberg uh, directs many of these things, including Project Diversity, and she would know, as would um, uh, Danielle, my graduate assistant. Okay, now <clears throat> we have to introduce Dr. Hu because uh, he's gonna speak for 10 minutes and then we will have about uh, 15, 20 minutes of questions from those in the audience. All right, Dr. Hu, as I said, met, chairs the Department of Government and Politics and coordinates the International Affairs Program. He was a visiting assistant professor at Colby College, Colgate University, and the University of Viaro in Portugal. In addition, he was a research fellow at the Institute of the World Economy and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and a research assistant at the Washington-based U.S. Institute of Peace. He received his PhD from American University but his BA and MA degrees from Peking University, which still calls itself Peking, even though the capital of China is now Beijing. Um, in, he is the author of the book, Explaining Chinese Democratization, that Prager published about um, seven, no, nine years ago. His current project that he's working on compares the policies of major powers toward cross-Taiwan Strait relations. Now, he will give us a sociological <coughs> political overview of what this means for these new immigrants, and especially from his own personal experience and his scholarly work, what it means uh, in terms of getting these new immigrants into power in government through the political process. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Hu here, and um, uh, we're delighted that uh, Dr. Garassi found him and brought him to, uh, <laughs> to Wagner College. Dr. Shoa Hu. Thank you very much, Senator Levin, and uh, for your kind words, and also for your service to the MI State and the Wagon College. And also, I, I should thank you for your fine trust in me. And I'm not expert on, on immigration. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, but I'm a political scientist, and I can say something about politics. And uh, judging from my accent, probably you recognize I was born and uh, grew up on Staten Island. <laughs> yeah. I, I came, in, came to the United States in 1989, and I came to uh, Staten Island in, nine, uh, in, in 2001. And uh, today, I just want to uh, share with you my view on the, the challenges facing the Chinese community in your politics and uh, make some predictions. And uh, I'm not as I mentioned to you, and this subject is rather new to me, and uh, sharing a panel with uh, Dr. Selva is very only a uh, year. New York uh, demography is very much like average Jew sh sharing a panel on National Football League with, with, with John Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let me just actually I just wrote something last night and let me just uh, read it. It'd be easy for me and probably for you. And uh, the Chinese uh, <coughs> participating in public office has been <coughs> lackluster. So far, only John Liu and has sat on a 51 member city council. In the 150 member New York State Assembly, only three Chinese uh, have held, held the same seat from the Flushing District in the past several years. <clears throat> what obstacles have the, have the Chinese community faced? 
the most obvious and probably most important one is the, is the fact that numbers matter in democracy. The 2000 uh, census found, found 424,000 uh, Chinese in the Empire State, which accounted for about 2.2% of the entire population in the state. 85% of them live in uh, New York City. Indeed, uh, the Chinese are not really new immigrants, and uh, they are the largest Asian group, yet they pair in comparison to other ethnic groups, such as uh, the Irish and uh, uh, Italians and uh, Jews and, uh, say, Hispanic and African Americans. <coughs> in a city famous for ethnic politics, it seems the Chinese haven't reached a critical mass and uh, so has to do well in, in electoral politics. Uh, I don't know which number it is, but uh, that's my uh, uh, guess. The second challenge comes from traditional Chinese culture. Why Chinese traditional politics contain many great traditions, such as merit-based civil service, service system? Some Chinese cultures don't sit well with the democratic politics. Uh, two two stand, uh, stand out. It is not e exaggeration to say that Chinese are rather apathetic to politics, and the Chinese view of politics seems more negative than the view held by mainstream <coughs> Americans. In traditional China, politics is dangerous business, which has more to do with self-serving than with public service. As a result of this, and many capable and decent Chinese have shown <coughs> politics. Uh, in terms of behavior, modern democracy requires candidates to articulate their policy and to represent their uh, constitu constitu constituents. And uh, this doesn't sit well with a middle, uh, middle way and the virtue of humility cherished by the Chinese culture. Chinese seem to uh, subscribe to the adage which goes, eloquence is civil and silence is, is gold. No matter how decent, knowledgeable, and uh, public spirited, a relatively reserved person cannot be <coughs> too successful in electoral politics. Third, <coughs> Social economic status matters. According to the 2000 uh, census, the Chinese were among the, were below the city average in terms of income, education, and English language skills. People with the lower socioeconomic status tend to lack interest and resources in political participation. And uh, let me give you just an anecdotal evidence. During my first two years at Wagner, I was so busy and uh, uh, with, with, with teaching that I decided to limit my uh, waiting time at the polling station to half an hour. If, if it's more than half an hour, I'm, I, I will quit because I just don't have time. <coughs> uh, luckily, I never had to wait for more than five minutes. Now just imagine underprivileged people who lack time and energy to participate in politics, which seem so remote from every life in the first place. Finally, Chinese are not homogenous. Lu Xingpai, a well-known China scholar who once served as the president of the American Political Science Association, uh, called China an Asian civilization masquerading as a modern nation state. Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, the founding father of the, people, uh, of the Republic of China, compelled the Chinese to a sheet of sand. The lack of unity or nationalism uh, among Chinese can be attributed to many factors, such as China's vast ter territory, huge population, diverse regions, and uh, ideological conflicts in modern time. The first Chinese group arrived in, in the 19th century, and more came, uh, most came from the province of Canton. Partly because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese population was dwindling. After 1965, Taiwanese and Hong Kongers <coughs> emigrated to, to America. After Deng Xiaoping opened China's door to the outside world, Men and Chinese came to New York. <clears throat> Their dialects are mutually uh, unintelligible. And besides, Chi uh, the Chinese are torn between financial conservatism advocated by the Republican Party and cultural diversity supported the, the, uh, by the Democratic Party. So it's probably half Chinese voted for Republican and half, half of them voted for, for Democrats. All this under, uh, further under, undermined Chinese influence in politics. These four factors limit numbers, uh, traditional culture, and uh, low socioeconomic status, and, uh, and the diverse nature of the Chinese uh, population uh, have posed and will continue <coughs> to pose challenge to the Chinese particip participation in city parks in the near future, probably in the in foreseeable future. However, several factors may uh, facilitate the Chinese participation. First is related, related to the Chinese community. The past three decades witnessed a rapid increase of the Chinese population. According to the New York Times, the number of reg registered Chinese American voters in the city jumped to 
112,000 in 2007, or 3% of the city's 3.7 million voters. That is a 36% increase since 2001. Probably I contribute a decimal point here. And uh, although we have to wait for the result of the next census, and my impression is that the Chinese uh, residents have become better off and better educated. Second, the rise of China will contribute to the Chinese participating in American politics. During the entire American history, China had often been weak, poor, and repressive. It is natural for <coughs> Americans to take the Chinese civilization lightly. Just as uh, a backward China doesn't reflect well on the Chinese community here in the city, a progressive China will change the perception of the Americans, including the Chinese Americans themselves. Finally, and uh, America has become more diverse and more open. The election of, of Barack Obama as American president reflects and re reinforce, uh, reinforces <coughs> the progress made by America. A society that cherishes individual achievement and appreciates the value of diversity will make it easier for the Chinese uh, participation. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lu. Now we have a period of uh, questions and answers. And uh, in the uh, Allied American principle of squatter sovereignty, you'll permit the moderator to perhaps uh, uh, ask the first uh, question, and then we'll open up to everyone here tonight. Um, Dr. Hu and uh, Dr. Salvo, um, I had recently read uh, a survey that was taken comparing New York to California. And uh, I believe part of the survey was also in The Economist magazine. Uh, it did not compare New York and California uh, that much, but it did emphasize California. Now, California sends to the U.S. House of Representatives, nine Latinos and three Asians. Now, California has a little bit less than uh, twice the population of New York. We don't have any Asians representing New York in the House of Representatives. And whereas California has nine Latinos uh, based upon population, we only have two, which is much less than 50% of California. Why has New York's various minorities not been able to get into government and positions of power through elected means, unlike the state of California? Now, Dr. Hu mentioned uh, John Liu. Not only is he the only member of the New York City Council who's Asian American and Chinese American, he's the first serious candidate in the Asian American community to run for citywide office. He is running for controller since Bill Thompson has to vacate it to run for mayor. And in the assembly, there was only one Chinese American representative there. Uh, having served in the New York State Senate, there are no Asians at all. So to both of you, why is New York slack in this area? Why has New York caught up to California by at least having half the representation they, they have in the Congress? Dr. Hu? Dr. Salvo? <coughs> I, I don't know California that well. And but you know New York. <laughs> Reasonably well, yeah. <laughs> for, for me, probably uh, we, we have witnessed the, the, the increased uh, number of, of Asian Americans, especially Chinese Americans. But I still think that the number is still uh, rather small in, in terms of the percentage. And the, 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 the number is <coughs> cited, and uh, there are about 3% of Chinese and uh, in, in Chinese American voters. In New York City, I really doubt three percent. Three percent makes uh, a deep impression, and uh, also uh, this is my my idea. New York City is famous for this kind of like uh, ethnic politics, and uh, probably be rather difficult for, for people to 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 
ethnic minority to, 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 to rise to the, to the occasion. Let me just give you a kind of like uh, anecdote here. And uh, in New York, <coughs> probably people would call each other and say, well, you're Italian and I'm um, Chinese or something like that. And, uh, but in other <coughs> places, people will not kind of like uh, pigeonhole you like that. But in New York City, people just treat you like you're, you're a certain group of people, not just an average person. That, that, that's my superficial answer. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Salvo. I'm going to ask uh, Frank, my, my colleague, to come up here and Frank help me out a little bit with this. <coughs> um, I, I am not a political scientist. I'm not going to pretend to be. So what I can offer you, and what Frank has done, uh, is Frank to say a few words. Um, you saw what I presented before about the mixtures that we have here. If you take a look at that overlay against all the turf in New York City, I want you to ask yourselves, in all fairness, how difficult or easy is it to build an ethnic coalition? And then go ahead to California. I am somewhat familiar with California's demography. California is going to be approaching, I guess, 38 or 40 million people, <laughs> the size of a country. <clears throat> And I want you to think about the fact that while they do have diversity, the mix you find here in tents in the city of New York and the absence of a mix in a lot of the other places perhaps allows coalitions, ethnic and racial, to build in ways that you don't see them here. Beyond that, I really can't say because I am not familiar with voting patterns. I'm not familiar with how uh, how that, how the whole political side works. Um, I leave that to the political scientists. But Frank, do you want to say a few words about this? I'll take a shot at it. Yeah. We don't have the map up, any of the maps by race, any of the track maps <coughs> by race on this slideshow, do we? Not, not, not here, not okay. at all. Um, the, uh, if we, we have maps that we often show that take the uh, 20, 117 or so, census tracts that the city has broken up into small areas, 4,000, 5,000 people areas. And we do it by race. We do white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Asian, non-Hispanic. Or you can do it by Chinese or Irish <coughs> or Italian or whatever. And it's very interesting to see the patterns. And you keep mentioning John Liu and Flushing. The one spot where you'll see this very heavy dose of Asians is Flushing. Downtown Flushing, there's two zip codes in there, 113 and 11355 one, 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 and 113554, five, five, which essentially is what we call downtown Flushing, near Main Street and Roosevelt Avenue, that area. And it's very heavily Asian. Chinese, Chinese think it's a third Chinatown. The Koreans think it's Koreatown. <laughs> and they're the major groups that are in there. And then there's a whole slew of other from Afghanis on up and down the, the eastern and western Chinese groupings in that area. So that has, where it's replaced a, a population downtown Flushing that was, for the last 30 or 40 years, is basically Jewish. High-rise apartment houses built after war, just before and after World War II that at that point became Jewish with people moving particularly out of Brooklyn and out of, out of Manhattan <coughs> to that new Flushing community, which is now 50 or 60 years old. The the rest of the surrounding areas is still a mix of old European white and Asians moving out, <coughs> moving eastward, out toward to Murray, through Murray Hill, out to Bayside, moving out on the North Shore, straight out, which is what everybody else has done. Nobody in New York moves much differently than the previous souls who lived in those neighborhoods. It, it's not done by race, it's not done by race, it's not done by color, it's done by where you live, how the transportation works what your economic situation is. If you got to Flushing, you've got some money. You can't live in, don't live in Queens, but you don't live in Staten Island without money. Maybe on the North Shore here and there you can survive in Staten Island without money. Anywhere else in Staten Island, you sort of buy your way in, you rent your way in or you buy your way in, and you have to have the cash. And Queens is the same sort of world. And that is the one spot where there's enough Chinese and <coughs> Koreans and other Asians in one spot that they can actually survive the gerrymanders that political, every 10 years, uh, every, every census, you get a, a throw at re, re districting 
on the state senate side, on the assembly side, on the congressional side. You redistrict this. Joe's <coughs> Joe's quite aware of this because he served as a, a special master for the courts in one of these little excursions in redistricting. I just was, I had a small map here that had the, the congressional districts in the, in, the, in the city of New York. You can't quite see them, but if you could, you'd, you'd realize nothing looks like any geography that any of us know. <laughs> they have fingers and tails and they wind, one of them winds through three boroughs, which elects a Hispanic woman. They, they took in sections of, of Williamsburg and sections of, of uh, Congressman Velasquez. Velasquez, Nidia Velasquez. Yes, Nidia Velasquez. <coughs> it's, a, it's a tripartite Puerto Rican, essentially, the base of its Puerto Rican district. But he's got Dominicans and others in it. But the, if you look at a map of Asians in New York, and, and Chinese are always 50% at least of the Asian population throughout New York and throughout New York history. It's, it's going down. It's 46%, I think, now, last time I looked. The, Asians are intertwined with what essentially are European districts, Irish, German, Italian, Jewish districts. So they never have enough people on their own outside of Flushing to elect somebody auto, sort of automatically. <coughs> they really would have to campaign against a candidate who represents one of the other groups or more of the, some of the, sometimes two and three parts of the other group, like a Pataki, if you will who had so many different ancestries that he could claim to be anything from Hungarian to Irish to heaven knows what else, <laughs> and be right. And uh, they don't have enough clout in any one area, geographically. They'd have to get a district that was actually drawn like this. The last thing a, a, a person drawing redistricting does is draw a district that looks like this. They look like fingers, tails, wings. They have, they go in and out and up and down, but they never, never look this one. That's the state senate six, and you can see that some of the darker. I'm embarrassed, but this was done by the Republicans uh, nine years ago. That's right. The Democrats will do it. Democrats, <laughs> Democrats will redistrict this time. That's right. But uh, so there isn't. A, there's no way, as of yet, that I think a, 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 an Asian could get elected in the city on on the strength of his own Asian population. He or she would have to appeal strongly across the board. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vardy. And now, <laughs> we're open. Yeah, please. I have told our speakers questions. we will end this uh, uh, forum at 6.15. And uh, even though some, some of the students who had 6 o'clock classes wanted to stay, I told them <coughs> they had to leave. So that we have now the students and some faculty <coughs> and community leaders who didn't have to leave at 6. We're going to go to 6.15, which is about 15 minutes from now. Questions? Yes. Uh, just uh, an observation. The question was asked about uh, people who are serving as elected officials and so forth. I don't think we can really even answer that. But there's another situation that uh, troubles me even more. If you look at the, the uh, services that we uh, have here in the city, police, fire, and so forth, you do not see the kinds of people we're talking about going for those kinds of, how many Chinese firemen do we have, policemen and so forth, which is quite different than the people who <coughs> came here from Europe after 1900. Uh, I mean, you look at the police department, primarily Irish, some Italian, fire department, the same thing, sanitation. They seem to have a need to get into some sort of government services. I don't see that. I don't think, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but I think that's even uh, more of a question than getting elected to office. However, the point that I wanted to make was that for those of us that are educators, my class are here, they're going to be teachers and so forth, what you said has a greater impact upon what we do because we see a transition in and out of the classroom during the school year, one school, PS57, 65% migration in and out in one year. <coughs> You can imagine what a, what a problem that is to teachers to try and maintain some sort of a sense of curriculum in the area. So that's a problem. I also think that when we talk about the people who are coming in, if they do serve in government, let's say they become people who make laws that affect education, what does that do to the, the curriculum in the future? What are our teachers going to have to deal with if we see a larger percentage of uh, people in, in government, of course. And that
that's, I think, where a lot of my students are feeling, and why most of them came. And I think uh, your explanation, uh, Dr. Salwood, was good. But we have those kinds of questions that we have to deal with. For instance, in special education, if you're going to put someone in special education, they have to have an evaluation. It has to be done in their dominant or native language. So where do you find people who speak Urdu and Twi and so forth and so on? There, I think, is where the people in, in the education department have a great problem, and I hope that maybe you can share that with some of your colleagues back in city government, because it, it, it really is a, is a problem that's going to get even larger. Well, uh, Dr. Is DeLuca yeah. is a professor at Wagner and a former principal uh, <coughs> public school of the New York City Board of Education. Dr. Salvo? Um, I, I, can, I can tell you about my experience of the past six or seven months. You know the mayor has a new, Mayor Bloomberg has a new executive order. The executive order essentially says that city agencies need to make a reasonable effort to provide services in languages other than English. And the analysis that we're doing, I've given already there's probably four or five presentations on the data and on the material that will serve not only as a backdrop for what languages are, are primary, so to speak. I didn't show you the list. There are 1.8 million people who speak a language other than English and have problems with English. Half of those, over 900,000, Spanish is the primary language, but there are four or five major groups under that that uh, also have English language issues. So the mayor, in the interest of public safety and in the interest of getting people involved, you know, there are a lot of people who turn around and say, well, what are we doing? Well, the answer is getting people involved in the, in the workings and business of New York, getting people, accommodating people making services available so they become part of, of New York. Um, and in, in essence, I have been working with the agencies and with the providers to uh, create, a, 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 create a system that will allow agencies to make a reasonable accommodation. So the city of New York is putting a effort, uh, forth an effort to, to recognizing that we have all these people who need, who need help and helping provide them with services. So that should make to some degree, the job of service providers outside of city agencies to make their jobs a bit easier. But I, I will not kid you that the, the challenge that, that I talk about a lot, we have a, a dynamic city that is quite vital. On the a flip side of that, there's a whole bunch of challenges that we face day to day on how to deal with this. It's true that if you have constant flows in and out, people going in and out of the classroom, what does it do for teachers who may have been raised in a curriculum where when you say those kids are being passed through, and then those kids who are in first grade, the odds of them getting to seventh grade in the same school, for a standpoint of a principal, that is one heck of a, of a situation. So you know, a number of kids who have different places and so on where they go to school. Um, that is a big challenge, and, and I'm not gonna kid you. I don't have the answer for that. I'm not in, in, in that area of education, but it is one, it is one heck of, a, of, of an issue. But the flip side is look at what we gain from all this. If we successfully, get people to buy into New York, so to speak, and become parts of this city. Like my, my parents were both born in Italy. My father came here, the story that you hear. It's the same story you'll hear about a Korean or a Chinese immigrant today. My father was Italian, he came in, worked, started his own business. Um, uh, it's the, the, the motivations, the migration patterns, as Frank pointed out, all stay the same. It's just the faces are different, the countries are different. The motivation's the same. Uh, we benefited in the past, and we hope to try to do something to continue to benefit. Um, but uh, it is, there are so many fronts where there are challenges, which is why we have to have good people in government. By the way, I didn't make my pitch. Government's really a good place to work. And it's not because of what's happened to the private sector, okay? Before this whole thing happened with the private sector, I would tell you, I've worked for government for 25 years, and my job is as exciting or better than it was when I first started. And there are a lot of people like me. Thank you, Dr. Salvo. Now, I'd like to have some questions from non-faculty, non-administrators, and students who are in the audience. Um, from one of the charts that was shown above um, and Dr. Salvo's presentation, we heard that um, the senior citizen community and those over 65 were largely responsible for a lot of the voting. And being that, I believe it said about 65% of them were Caucasian, they therefore had greater clout in a lot of the, especially local elections. Now when we jump down to the 18 to 24 age range and below
below 18 age range, we noticed that those percentages were much more evenly distributed. I was wondering if the ethnicity of, um, of the population that we lose through domestic migration as well as international migration mirrors the ethnic population of New York City as a whole. And if it doesn't, how is that going to reflect, like if, <coughs> if 40 years from now, if we have those same people in the 18 to 24 age range um, acting as those senior voters, is it th therefore going to be easier for minority populations to have a stronger say in, in government and politics? Or, or does our outflux not mirror I, I, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah, I, I wanted to I, say, I, are you thinking of switching <coughs> from education to no. government? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me say this. I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. Um, uh, the people who leave are still disproportionately European, disproportionately native born. Okay? The people who come in uh, come in from a whole bunch of countries. But um, if you take a look at the composition, how it's changing the composition of the population, His, Hispanic nations are big. Okay. In terms of, of immigration, also Asian, the Hispanic countries, Asian countries. Um, when it comes to the black population, it's um, people leaving are disproportionately African American, with with a heritage in in the U.S. People coming in are Caribbean, and the newest immigrants are from Africa. The um, biggest you know on the North Shore, there's a big African population. The largest African concentration in the city right now is, well, uh, actually, in terms of numbers, is, exists in central Brooklyn and in the West Bronx. The West Bronx, Ghana, is the big one. Uh, in central Brooklyn, it's a whole bunch of different countries in terms of numbers. But I'm not trying to take away from what's going on in the North Shore. It certainly is substantial, but in terms of sheer volume. So what's happening is you're getting an internal exchange of population. The black population will become more Caribbean, more African as opposed to African-American with heritages in the, in the South. In the Hispanic population, Puerto Ricans are leaving New York City, okay? And we're taking in Dominican Republic, people from the Dominican Republic and Mexico and so on. So uh, it is changing the racial uh, composition of New York, and it will change the voter <coughs> population, and I don't know what the word minority means anymore. I mean, the word minority means something at the federal level <coughs> for federal uh, voting rights and so on, as most of you know. But um, uh, in terms of New York City's demography, how do you Thank you, Dr. I that? think I saw the hand of one of the community leaders go up. Can you uh, identify yourself, sir? Okay. Yeah, okay. My name is Moses. My name is Moses D. Genzi. Moses D. Genzi. And you represent the life of president Bit for Immigrant Information Center as the president. Uh, is that the Liberian Center or the overall? No, it's crossed by the Immigrant Information Center. Center, right. <coughs> Uh, I, yeah, I listened to Dr. Dabo very much, and uh, I saw the demographic just about. I, I was just about to ask a question about uh, the total bias of foreign born. And then uh, I wanted to know uh, the new coming African. It was not the <coughs> I, Okay, I, I will tell you what it is. Yeah, right. If you take a look at the current list of countries, represented coming into New York. Um, the African presence is growing every year. It is unprecedented. It may approach one out of every 10 immigrants in the next few years. Right now, it's about eight or 9% of the stream in. It is, it is very large. It's getting bigger. Um, that is very substantial. We see a steady stream. The biggest country is Ghana. Okay, Nigeria is just behind. And then there's a whole big list behind that. It is the new, the, if you had to, t you asked me what is on the horizon for New York's immigration, that along with uh, South Asia, along with Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, and the uh, countries of Sub-Saharan Africa would be, would be probably, would, would be what I would say. Thank you. Very good question and a very good answer. Uh, let's, I think we have time for one more question. <coughs> Uh, before we uh, end tonight's session. We've had Mercado Gonzalo here, who represents, um, works in intimately with immigration rights uh, and works with the uh, undocumented Mexican community in Puerto Rico. Maybe you want to say a word about that community and the community? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, Which we're going to tell us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of uh, what we're talking about obviously has to do with uh, yeah, the, the whole subject of immigration, especially when we were talking about the students. Um, usually the population, Mexican population or other Latin American country, um, because of the ghost of immigration, they, uh, they're usually very low income community. Uh, they're usually uh, people who work very long hours uh, and obviously people who move around a lot and they obviously drag their children. Um, so when the, profe uh, the, te the professor was speaking about, you know, the, the flow of, uh, of students in and out, that has a lot to do with the conditions that many of these immigrants are living or what makes them move from one place to another. Um, so I think that has a direct impact. Um, and also, I mean, because of, what, of the work that we do, we see a lot of uh, uh, very big problems in terms of discrimination and harassment. Uh, we probably <coughs> tend to make people- Are the Mexican American <laughs> or the Latino population? Yeah, the newest, the newest uh, immigrants, and most of them undocumented, of, of course. So uh, if the, you are in a part of the country where they institute a law like, for example, 27G, which gives the, the power of police to enforce immigration laws, people are gonna move out of that area. Uh, and that's why in the recent years, uh, after 9-11, we, we started seeing a, a flow of, of people and migrants going to big cities, away from the uh, you know the, the states in, in the middle of the country where most of these laws were instituted, <coughs> going into uh, what they call sanctuary cities like San Francisco, like LA, like New York. Uh, so that also has a lot to do with how these immigrants move around. Okay, Dr. Salvani. Well, I, I, I can uh, tell you that the, in terms of the uh, excitement, the Mexican population is right up there. I mean, in terms of numbers, we are constantly trying to estimate what the true size is, and it's rather difficult to do. We figure in the city of New York, minimally, there's at least 350 to 400,000 Mexicans right now. Um, Mexico is probably surpassed Italy on Staten Island by now. Uh, Mexico is likely number one foreign-born group on Staten Island, um, based on our data. Um, and then many of the African countries are there also on that top list. But um, Mexico, um, certainly in terms of New York's future, um, we've only scratched the surface in terms of Mexican immigration, as you can see from those charts. Uh, once it takes hold here, full tilt, um, it will ch once again change the composition and we'll, we'll start a new chapter in the city's history. That's what's great about it. Um, I was at a presentation last night where a colleague talked about uh, um, the fact that New York is an unfinished city, of, always a city of, um, that is uh, a story that is being written as, as we live and speak here. I, I, I would hope that all of you would, would get a gain a sense that you're living in an incredible time in the city's history. 100 years from now, they'll look back and they'll say, I wonder what it was like, just like we look back 100 years and think about 1910. Um, we are living in an incredible time. You're living in a place where people come together, and I'm not going to say it's all roses, it's not, but where people tolerate each other in the interest of opportunity, in the interest of quality of life, in a way that the rest of the world would really benefit from. Um, because the truth is, you mentioned before about some of the combinations. If you go to Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, you have side by side religious group, different religions, different ethnicities, that in 95% of the world would be going at each other. <laughs> it is unbelievable, the Arab populations mixing in with the, with the, uh, the Muslim and Jewish uh, faiths, com combinations that are multiracial, multi-ethnic, other parts of the world, you would have a very different situation. So if I've left you with a shred of that tonight, I, 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 would, I would be very happy. Okay, Dr. Okay. Salvo. Dr. Salvo intimated that this could just be the beginning and not the end. And let me uh, mention to everyone here, uh, I'm sorry we went over the time limit, but let me mention to you, this is only the beginning. For you also, not in terms of your experiences in New York City, but the Cary Center with Wagner College hopes to take these presentations tonight and these comments and uh, perhaps some of the questions, edit it and put it into the form of a monograph, which will then be available to all of you here uh, and those who are not here this evening. 
I thank you very much, Dr. Hugh, Dr. Salvo, Dr. Vardy, for an excellent talk.